Welcome to this video lecture on internal convection. We're going to be talking about convective heat transfer when we have flow that is within a channel. So specifically today we're going to be talking about thermal considerations. In the last lecture we talked about hydrodynamic considerations or the formation of the velocity boundary layers and the velocity entry region. This time we're going to talk about thermal boundary layers and how those grow into creating a thermal entry region when you have bounded flow in a pipe or a channel. So the thermal boundary layer, if you recall from external convection, if you recall from external convection, we had a fluid flow. If we had just a, a flat plate, let's say it's heated and it's at a surface temperature of Ts. When we had flow encounter this flat plate, let's say our flow is coming in at a bulk fluid temperature of T infinity, we uh, if what started to happen was we would get this temperature profile forming. So you'd have um, higher temperature here right at the edges and it would take a while for that temperature to propagate up into the bulk fluid. But we typically characterized convection via Newton's law of cooling as HA, so our Q convection is HA times T surface minus T infinity. So basically, far away from this flat plate, uh, our flow is unbounded. We have just a, a whole lot of fluid to, to heat up. So if we assume that that fluid to be infinite, then we basically assume that our, all the heat we add to our plate never really impacts the bulk fluid temperature. So it's different in internal flow internal flow, let's say we had another flat plate here on the top creating this parallel plate kind of situation. So as our thermal boundary layer here grows, we're going to have another thermal boundary layer on the top growing and when those two converge we end up with what's called flow that is fully developed thermally. So when that flow becomes fully developed thermally um, the things like our convective heat transfer coefficient will level off and it'll just stay at a constant value. Whereas in external flow, the convection coefficient was always changing as the boundary layer grew, as delta T grew, as that boundary layer got thicker and as the Reynolds number changed, our heat transfer coefficient actually changed with it. However, when the flow becomes fully developed, like in this region, we will see that our heat transfer coefficients will level off. So another consequence that I want to remind you of is that convection, when you have bounded flow, so when you have bounded flow, the heat that you're adding into the fluid will actually have a measurable difference on the fluid flowing through because that flow is no longer infinite. That fluid is, there are not infinite amounts of it. So now you can actually heat up that fluid as you go. So we'll, we'll typically be dealing with the mean temperature. So when we're talking about convection for internal flow, our relationship will change where our driving force our, will be this temperature difference, Ts minus T mean, where T mean represents the mean temperature of the fluid as measured radially or as measured perpendicular to the axial direction. So if this is x, we're talking about T mean going this way. So we, we'd basically be making the assumption that our temperature is uniform with respect to R or with, with, with respect to Y. However, if this is heated, you can see that because we have now a finite amount of fluid flowing through our system, we can actually impact that T mean. So we will be seeing that our mean temperature is actually increasing with X. And how it's increasing will be something that we um, figure out later using energy balances. So the mean temperature is mean temperature with respect to this direction radially or with respect to y, but that mean temperature will actually change with respect to x. So the mean temperature will actually be a function of x, which is the distance down the pipe or the channel. Okay, so here is this with a much more professional graphic. You can see that the thermal boundary layers, when the flow is bounded, those thermal boundary layers grow into each other. At the point that they grow into each other, the flow is said to be fully developed. 
before the in the thermal entrance region the flow is not fully developed and so you could see how that would greatly impact things like the convective heat transfer coefficient. The fully developed region is measured because we get this if we're keeping our surface temperature constant um, but our fluid temperature is going to be continuously um, heated as we go so we would actually see this temperature profile still change as we go down because the fluid temperature will be constantly changing as a function of x but the surface temperature may remain the same so to characterize when we have entered fully developed flow we have to do that using normalized temperatures so basically because our temperature profile as a function of x will keep changing we have to look at this normalized temperature profile so it's normalized we look at the surface temperature at a particular x subtract the temperature measured at any r so it could be measured here or here uh, or or here really so when that stop, stops changing relative to the difference between our surface temperature and our mean temperature when that stops changing as a function of x is when the flow is said to be fully developed thermally. So really this isn't something you need to worry too much about, just know that that's sort of what it means. What you should be wondering about is, uh, what you should be trying to commit to memory is that you're going to be dealing with a mean temperature. So while there is this uh, temperature profile here, we'll basically be doing all of our relationships as if this were all at a mean fluid temperature. And let me draw that. It's probably more like here. Okay, so we'll typically be dealing with the mean temperature. So how do we go about getting that mean temperature? So one way, if you knew the actual temperature profile with respect to R, then you would do this integration. So basically you'd be integrating over the entire cross-sectional area at a particular X. Um, so we integrate over that full cross-sectional area, we divide by M dot CP and that ends up giving us our mean fluid temperature. And in this class, you probably will never have to actually do this because we really won't be worrying about T as a function of R. We'll just be using this mean temperature. So we'd be using the mean temperature as a function of X. Okay, so just a reminder that the using Newton's law of cooling, we could characterize the flux locally by using a local heat transfer coefficient. And that would be equal to the surface temperature minus the mean temperature. We could also use this relationship that Q, if we are looking through flow through a complete pipe, is equal to m dot cp times the temperature difference. So these are, when we talk about T out and T in, these would actually be mean temperatures as well. So the mean temperature out and the mean temperature in. So just remember that the mean temperature just means you take the average uh, radially or perpendicular to the axial direction. So the thermal entry length that we talked about does have a big effect on heat transfer. So when that flow comes in and the boundary layers are still forming and the flow is yet to be fully developed, we would see this changing H. And typically H is getting smaller and smaller because the boundary layers are getting bigger and bigger. There's more of that layer that heat has to propagate through to get from the surface into the middle of the channel. But once the flow becomes fully developed, once those boundary layers converge and your flow becomes fully developed thermally, then you typically see that your heat transfer coefficient levels off. So to know how much of an effect this entry region has, we can use these relationships down here. So if we want to know um, when our flow becomes fully developed thermally, we can use this relationship that the flow would become fully developed thermally um, as a ratio of 0.05 times the Reynolds number times the Prandtl number. And we could solve for this actual distance by multiplying this by D. So this is for laminar flow. So this would tell us how far into the pipe does it take for the flow to become thermal de thermally developed. The approximate rule of thumb for turbulent flow is a little simpler and it's independent of Reynolds number and Prandtl number. So basically it takes about 10 pipe diameters for your flow to become uh, fully developed thermally. So just as an example of how we could use this, if we had a pipe that is 1000 meters long and let's say our diameter is just 10 centimeters, 
we would expect our flow to become fully developed thermally in about one meter. So we would take our pipe diameter, multiply that by 10 to give us one meter. So basically it would tell us that this region is one meter long and if our pipe is a thousand meters long well then this region is really only going to be 0.1 percent of our total pipe length so we may make the approximation that we're just going to neglect this region. However if it were a shorter pipe let's say the, the whole pipe is only one meter long so if our L were one meter then that would tell us that our entire flow is in the entry region and it never becomes fully developed. So it uh, just this is a these are some good rules of thumb to just tell you how much do you need to worry about this entry region because in many cases you can just neglect it especially if you have a long pipe with a small diameter.